Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Connect with your potential customers wherever they are. Effective uses Comcast viewership data insights to combine advanced targeting capabilities with premium TV and streaming content so you can deliver the best ad experiences to your audience no matter how they watch. Visit EFFECTV.com. Oscast. Hello world, I'm John Bruni and you're listening to Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. On September 7th, while in Dubai, I was fortunate to have caught up with David Kandan, Executive Director of Australian security company Ostability. For long-time listeners of Strategicon, we had David on with us before on episode 52. Ostability specializes in a number of critical security domains, including counter-radicalization, counter-terrorism, and the protection of women and children. Ostability operates in the Middle Eastern and African regions. What makes Ostability unique among hardcore security outfits is that it has a very strong moral and ethical base. The company also has a far more realistic approach to lending assistance to areas of the world where Western norms and conditions are either resisted outright or are not well understood. Ostability takes time to understand the different cultural settings it is engaged in. And as we all know, taking time is something that many buccaneers in the corporate security world are not good at doing. While talking to David in Dubai, we spoke of the problems in rolling out proper and consistent government policies on issues like counter-terrorism and counter-narcotics. I thought that this would make for a very interesting episode of Strategicon, and hence my invitation to David to join us today. Also in the studio are David Olney and Tim Whiffen. Before we start today's episode, I would like to remind listeners that Strategicon can be found on the Oscast Network, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, and on the Sage International Australia website, www.sageinternational.org.au. David, I just want to continue on our conversation that we had when we met in Dubai last month. It was around about trying to figure out the best way forward for governments to organize themselves for sustainable ways in which they can get on top of issues like counter-terrorism, counter-radicalization, and counter-narcotics. And we were talking about things in terms of it not being a thing that sits very well across electoral cycles. Electoral cycles here in Australia, as you know, are basically two and a half years before we have to think about going to the polls again. So that doesn't give governments enough time to sit down and think through a policy that will be in the national interest. Because ultimately, whatever a political party will deem as a national interest is actually in the short-term interest of the party itself. It's not the national interest for all Australians. Essentially, uh, David, you know, if you could revisit some of the more enlightened thinking that you had with regard to long-term planning for getting on top of some of these trickier issues... Yeah, so what what we discussed is what I strongly believe in is that issues such as um, countering terrorism, radicalisation and some of those challenges we're facing today, the objectives to be met in countering them cannot be done by the electoral cycles as we're discussing because it just doesn't match. In in our countries we go through four years, eight years, etc. I think we should look at making the communities responsible for seeing the longer term objectives through regardless of uh, what government is in place so at the moment the governments set the mandates and they see it through for for the length of the time someone is in office in my opinion it would work much better if the communities were in charge of seeing the mandate through and the government was there to support them i hope that makes sense as a national or a country, let's say Australia, we set a mandate as to where we want to be 20 years from now or 30 years from now in countering radicalization. And we make the communities responsible for seeing them through and the government supports them rather than what where it's at now. We might see better results at the end of that, in my opinion. 
So, David, are you thinking some sort of form of direct democracy here, like you could make use of technology to have everyone say, well, look, what policy settings would be like? And, you know, if the population as a whole, say, vote in a direct democracy form for those policy settings, that can be something against which you judge any government, not about what they're offering, but how well they've met those predetermined, pre-chosen direct democratic decisions. Exactly what I'm thinking. You see, some issues, they've got to be separated from politics and countering radicalisation, terrorism. Some of these issues that we're facing today, they cannot be mixed with politics. It, it, it just doesn't work, and it hasn't worked. I mean, we've got the evidence that it hasn't worked because you may have uh, someone in office that has the right intentions and they do what they need to do, but at the end of it, they're going to be out in four, eight, eight years, etc. But to counter these issues, we need a much, much longer time to be able to get some solid results out of it. To have some sort of intergenerational impact, of course, will require the cooperation of existing political parties and candidates. How do you see us being able to communicate the importance of separating these mission-critical government issues from politics? Because, you know, up until this point in time, politicians like to cash in on the fear factor, fear mongering, whether it's about terrorism, whether it's about narcotics. Everyone uses these issues to their own electoral advantage. And I I really find it very difficult to see how anyone would be able to convince the political elite to step away from things that they've had their grubby little hands on for a long, long time now. Well, I think you said it, and and it's spot on, is that politicians cash in on on these type of issues. And it's got to be through education. So like we discussed when we were here, we've got to start much, much earlier in the communities, be it at schools, etc. You've got to change the mindsets of both the normal community and the future politicians. So in my opinion, if you started nice and early, the next Prime Minister of Australia, say 20 years from now, he or she is just at primary school now. So if we started nice and early and we change the mentality of our youth, of our kids at school and let them see that some things have got to be separated from politics, everything will change its cycle when it's time. So 20 years from now, when the next prime minister gets on board, they already understand that that some things can't be cashed in on you know, countering terrorism or countering the effects of uh, transnational serious organised crime is one of those things. Yeah, it's good to be aware of them, but it's not something that you should win votes over and not see the results through. So basically, you, you can't just talk to talk. It just You've got to put in results in place. Have some sort of uh, civics program, effectively, in schools, yeah? I, that's what I think. Um, you know, we, we've got to educate our communities from nice and early on both aspects. One, how do we, how do we counter these uh, security phenomena from the community perspective? and changing the mindset of our politicians, of our future politicians, not not the ones that are in office today or are likely to be in office five or ten years from now. We've got to play the long game, John. This is my point, and this is what I keep saying, is that we're not playing the long game. We're fighting fires at the moment, and we're continuously going to be in the same circle. Something has to break that cycle. And my opinion is that breaking the cycle is that we have to change the mentality of future generations. It would seem that there's probably an additional step here from my perspective, David, and that is that to undertake most of these long-term policies would require organisations of talented people with the right skills being given the resources to work on stuff long time. So what we need is a lot more agencies to work on things who are not subject to their funding changing every three years. That as long as they're meeting their remit to get on with the task and they're doing it effectively and they're using resources well, they should know that the next year they have money, they have the access to hire good you know, future people to bring into the workforce to keep getting on with the problem. So part of the civics thing would be to create a generation who don't necessarily want to be politicians but want to be part of organisations who have good, secure, long-term funding and a higher degree of autonomy than most departments have under a minister who's too fixated on the political cycle. That's spot on. Uh, Even if we look at the Australian side where we have this new Department of Homeland that is being charged with fighting 
transnational serious organised crime. In my opinion, those got to be the top of department or national security agencies that have that higher degree of autonomy, and they're not really linked to certain political party. So, you know, of course, they've got to have oversight. Everybody has to have oversight. But they can't be afraid as to if a decision they make is not necessarily aligned with the political objectives of that particular party. They're going to get punished for it in terms of having them funding taken away or the person in charge of that unit being removed because their decisions aren't popular in the political arena. Yeah, they really need to be statutory authorities so that they can act independently, something like the ACCC or the ABS, where there's a minister doing oversight, but the minister is there to make sure they're transparent and accountable, not to set policy for them. Exactly right. So they, therefore, they can, I mean, you've got a lot of men and women in uniform in the national security agencies that have the right intent, but they can't really fight this war with their hands tied behind their backs. And in my opinion, their hands are tied behind their backs because they can't, they've, the decisions they've got to make, whether they know it or not, is got to be aligned with that particular party that's in, in power at that stage. It's got to be popular with them, otherwise it won't work for them. So you always have the politics involved and this is why I believe we're not winning this war. And in fact, I would go as far as saying that we're losing it because it is tied 100% with who is in office and what is their motivation at that time. The other thing too is, you know, since 9-11, we've very much seen the politics of fear become normal. The political parties tell us how terrible it is and how they're going to save us in their three-year term, which in both cases, both things are a lie. It's not as terrible as they say, and they're not going to save us. So if you take that politics of fear away from them, and move it to institutions with consistent budgets. Politics has to be more progressive and more positive because we've handed over the significant long-term tasks of making a stable state to institutions full of people who can get on with their job as long as they're willing to work under transparency and accountability. As communities, we've got to take charge of our own destiny. When it comes to issues such as countering terrorism, radicalisation, violent extremism, these are issues that are affecting communities on ground zero, if we get our communities, if we get our education departments involved quite earlier, we would have to start changing mindsets. Mm. Look, what I'm saying, it may may seem far-fetched, but all I'm trying to say here is that we have to try something different. And this is what I can see would be something different that we haven't tried before because we're always in the short cycle. But the, the groups or the entities that we're up against, they play the long game and they have been playing the long game. So there's a clear disconnect here where they can make decisions as, as to where they would like to be 30 years from now. But if you look at countries like Australia, US, UK, etc., the prime ministers or, or, or the groups that are in power, they'd be lucky to be able to make a plan that's where they want to be two years from now. You know, there's a significant difference between those two platforms. And this is why we're losing this battle um, against issues such as violent extremism. It's that wonderful comment, and I can't remember who said it in Afghanistan 10 years ago, you have watches, but we have time. <laughs> that's it, and that's all they've got. And you see, if you have a look at the way they, they set their objectives in place, it's not about who will win the next vote or the next election. Their mindsets are set in the communities, their beliefs are set in the communities, and they have been there for generations. That that clear disconnect is that we're not doing this out in the West, and, and we've, got to, we've got to look at what is best for us and how we want our communities to look different 20, 30 years from now and set those objectives in place, and that just doesn't match with the politicians and their objectives. It's interesting, just listening to what you're saying, there's often a refrain in democracies that, oh, wouldn't it be so much better if we had a benevolent dictator who would just come in and magically change policy in the direction that we want because obviously when that happens, things are going to be effective. We can have long-term thinking in our policy cycles because we don't have to worry about the short-termism that seems to be a, a a disease of democracies. I mean, it's a, it's a fundamental disadvantage, if you will. I think that there is another thing that comes out of this, and that is the medium-term and short-term arrangements that you would need to put into place while the long-term plans are being created. 
because obviously there's a public perception about drugs, there's a public perception about terrorism, and it is as short-term as the electoral cycle, and the media feeds into this viciously. So when the media is chasing a story, obviously it's always going to be a bad news story. It's going to play into the political mindset of those who want to control fear, control the message, and people get alarmed, and then they vote according to where they're, where they're situated on the fear spectrum. This is something that needs to be combated relatively quickly after you then start communicating to the people that we need to have a long-term strategy. Otherwise, you're going to have total policy disconnect. You're going to have a continuation of the same short-term thinking for the next 25 years before we get the civics program up and running. <laughs> well, what I can't see doing any, any harm is that when... You know, when the watch changes and, and a prime minister goes out, in our case, and a new one comes in or a new political party comes in, I can't see any negative outcome if on issues such as CVE that the previous party was running was handed over and carried on. I, OK, I get it that you want to disagree on other issues or you want to have said you want to set your own agenda on other issues. But we're just talking about a few topics that everybody's got to agree on. And if the previous party was running it, that went that would have gone through Parliament. Everybody would have voted and agreed upon it. So what I can't what I don't understand is why does that change when it gets handed over to a new prime minister from within the same party or a new party? All I'm saying is that they've got to agree on these things. And some issues have got to be carried through once the flag gets handed over to the new incoming person. See, it's interesting. From a theoretical perspective, we could use sort of the Copenhagen School's idea of securitization on this, that some issues cannot be solved through normal means of the functioning of the state and politics and are put in the security category. And in doing so, what we're saying is these things cannot be dealt with in a normal way. So that's nothing new. We've done that nonstop since 9-11 and we've put more and more issues in the security bucket. The problem is we've said they're in the security bucket, but we haven't taken on this long term view. So if we could come up with a policy setting that says once something is in the security bucket, it's going to be long term. It needs to be bipartisan. Parliament works to reform and adjust, not to radically change course. And we guarantee resource levels to the institutions who work on it. So in real terms, you know, we have some of the steps in place and the other steps to head in the direction you're suggesting are eminently doable if the decision could be made that the national interest is more important than political self-interest. The million dollar question is that if the decision could be made. So the, what we're saying is that, look, the answer is there. We're not saying that we don't know it. But what it comes down to is that politicians are winning votes on these topics and getting them to hand that over and win votes on other matters that are important is, you know, the whole political race and winning votes since 9-11 has changed because these are the topics that people are getting into office over. So how do you get them to hand it over? And it's got to be, again, through education and, and persistence by communities. We may not see this change today, but if we start talking about it today and continue with it, we may see that the political landscape may change a few years from now. Part of the problem, I think, seems to be not necessarily that parties can't agree on anything, it's that they can't be seen to agree on anything, that, that actually part of their image seems to be that they have to say something. And combativeness has been Com normalised. Yeah. yeah, so for instance, you know, uh, if we take uh, immigration, for instance, in Australia, where the parties don't really differ that much, but the rhetoric around that is completely different, where they either look soft or hard or on, on particular yeah. issues, and it actually, in, in reality, the policy is... It's been securitised similar. and the policy is similar, so why have the pointless debate? Exactly. So, and, and I mean the pointless debate amongst the politicians. Mm. A, a debate within society about what we should do as a nation mm. is important. The other thing that seems to be coming out of this is what we're really saying at some level is that politicians should serve at the discretion of the population. They want to be there, that's fine. But what's more important is not that they win us, but that we are convinced they're adding some sort of value. So it's almost like a rethinking of why you would want to be a politician and what you seek to do while you're there. Are you effectively serving your country or are you building a career? So what we're suggesting in some ways is an anti-careerist model for politics, that it's public service far more than it's career building. I, are you sort of suggesting we should go the French way, you know, how the French have got, oh, what do they call it, the École Academy? Normal, yeah. yeah, you know, where, where all the members of the French elite 
get sort of socialized together, they grow up together, they think along the same lines, and when they go into their respective parties, they have a sense of... Well, parties and military and intelligence and big business. Right. But you've got to remember that that French system is incredibly meritocratic. You can be like Nicolas Sarkozy and get there as a migrant's child by being an overachiever. Mm. So you can only pull this off if you are willing to genuinely make it open to anyone who's willing to work to become capable of running the joint. I'm curious about how this would all work in an Australian situation where the adversarial system is so much a part of our systemic form of governance. Yeah, we're also so sick of it because it's not achieving much. Well, well we may be sick of it. Those people who are give, you know, giving us the Kool-Aid aren't sick of it. They get that they What's get the to career they chose. So, yeah, the, the oh, whole yeah. thing is the performance art of yeah. disagreeing. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the classic things I remember being told sitting on a plane once by a Qantas employee is how many times before Julia Gillard and Tony Abbott were leaders of their party, they would sit on a plane together and happily chat. Mm. Which means all the garbage after that was just a performance. So we've, we've elevated politics to high theatre then? Yeah, and, and it, without it's, content. It's, it's become more of a show rather than anything else. That, that, that's what it is. And, and the type of issues that we're facing, whether being the, the influence came being won by some of our adversaries in, in our areas or geographical areas, or whether it's the basic issues of basic crime around communities, these things are being missed because as politicians, they just speak about it, but they don't see it through. So uh, it's absolutely right. You know, when the cameras are off, you see a whole different performance rather than when the cameras are on. Mm. I'm, I'm curious about the current heads of respective agencies. If they were to listen in onto this podcast, what they would take out from the podcast? Would they agree with the idea of in, you know putting in place long-term, sustainable, you know, depoliticized versions of their agencies? Or would they they think, well, you're all in cloud cuckoo land, that's not going to happen, and we're not even going to try to go down that path because well, it's not good for our career. It would largely depend if they'd started as someone at the base level doing the job for the community good or if they're a political appointee. Yeah. And very clearly there are two different groups of people at head of agency level. Mm. There are people who started at 19 or 20 in the most fundamental role in the organisation and took 25 years to rise to the top. And there's political appointees that got parachuted in from the corporate world with no understanding of how the public service works or genuinely how the public good works. So that's that problem's already there and wouldn't be changed, I don't think. Yeah. What do you think, David? You you agree or you've got a, a different perspective? I, I genuinely would, would I tend to think that if, if somebody puts on a uniform and takes on an oath to protect their country or their communities, but I believe their objectives are to do exactly that. I think if somebody was to listen to this podcast from head of agencies, the national security agencies, if they are people in uniform, and as you quite rightly said, it, not political appointees, they would agree with this. They would agree that putting in long-term objectives, regardless of what political party is in place, is probably the only way forward. What, what I don't see is that other than this option, I don't see too many other options being thrown around or discovered. So my point is that you, you cannot continue to do the same thing and, and expect different results. That's the definition of insanity. And yeah. I don't get why we're continuously doing that. Mm. You're listening to episode 70 of Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. This week, we're talking about how governments can move past career politicians and into long-term policy. Our musical break for this episode is courtesy of Leaf and Stem, one of Strategicon's Adelaide favourites. This is their song, These Conversations.
smile from my face. It's like a shape's been shifted. These Conversations by Leaf and Stem. A fitting name for the episode as we're having a conversation about how governments can move past short-term and into long-term policy. It's all right, David. I often throw out a a crazier idea, and that is to get rid of party politics altogether. And every five (laughs) years, just randomly select 500 Australians between the ages of 18 and 70 who aren't in jail, don't have a debilitating mental illness, and whack them in Parliament for the next five years. So it's all about... the quality of the people providing information. Do, they, they might actually do a better job, so that could be something well, to you do could, as well. And That's the thing is, you could say no if you were offered the spot, but if you were offered a five-year chance to actually get off your bum and shape your country, how many people would step up with the right frame of mind? Mm. I actually think lots would. How, how many people? Okay, I, I. How many people would you actually want that say yes, and how many people would you want? That say no, if that make if that makes sense. Wouldn't so, know till we try. Yeah, and then, so. then, but and I'd rather do, do try. Do you pay them or do you not pay them? Oh, you absolutely pay them because they're going to have to walk away from whatever they're doing. And how much do you pay them? Enough money to make sure that that five years doesn't destroy the rest of their lives, having stepped away from what might be the beginning of a career. So, and the reason why I'm asking is uh, obviously there is an element of corrupting influence when it comes to money and politicians and the nexus between the corporate world and money, politicians and media tends to lessen rather than strengthen forms of governance around the Commonwealth here in Australia. So I think that you'd have to be very careful with what kind of financial inducements you provide because ultimately I agree with what you say, David, but I also agree that there has to be a point at which you you have to have a, a sense of loyalty to your country that stands you above the money. Yeah, okay, cover my expenses, uh, fly me to Canberra for whenever I have to go there, put me up in a hotel, you know, not the Ritz-Carlton, but, you know, something that doesn't have cockroaches in there, and I'll do my job because I love my country and I want to see it progress. But if you then start dangling financial inducements to random people – who will probably, depending on where they come with the socioeconomic order, will gravitate toward the money and think, well, this is a good bit of money. I'm going to go to Canberra. It's a couple of trips. Gets me out of the hovel that I'm currently in and wherever the hell I come from. Then you're not going to attract the right people either. Yeah, but I think you're totally in under underestimating the significance of randomness. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're assuming that with randomness, you're going to get any particular group consistently. And if you've got random people potentially as your democratic representatives, Mm. 
you can invest a lot in the people that keep them transparent and accountable. And you can make it legit if you're found to be corrupt. There is no long-term stuffing about like an impeachment. Mm. There is a one week in court, goodbye, you're out. Find your replacement. Mm. Like you're assuming a slow, useless system like we currently have that privilege is privilege. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and for argument's sake, David, you, you, you've got to, you've got to ground all of this in, in a, in a sense of reality. I mean, I, I loved what uh, David and I were talking about that the long-term thing I think is, is fundamental to moving forward as a country. We need to depoliticize various agencies to get traction. I mean, we've got these problems. We've got drug ac- epidemics. We've got issues. Yeah, with let's reality. go back to drugs. But, let's do one of these, one thing at a time. Okay. Okay. There's a drug epidemic. Yes. Right. But let's face a simple reality. Humans love drugs every culture in history has loved drugs so the issue is not drugs the issue is crime and drugs combined so unless we're going to decouple those two we're not going to get anywhere because you can try and get rid of drugs but you can't get rid of humans love of drugs all right and saying we're going to go from here to have a glass of red after (laughs) yeah well um (laughs) okay well, well, all right, but in the public imagining, and again, you know, we have to drag the public into this debate at some point as well, right? So we have this idea that we know that we need to do something. We need to cordon off certain agencies for the public good, for the national good of getting on top of fundamental issues that we have. Now, whether it be drugs, whether it be anything else that happens to perplex the nation, how are we going to do that? How are we going to bring the people on board when they also have been habituated by seeing things from short-term perspectives in an adversarial way? Because obviously, you know, they're, they're conditioned to see it like that. So how, we, how, do we change the, how do we change the course now to affect the long-term? Look, if I may just come in with a comment here, I, I, I can't see on many other issues what we put in place and we tend to do is that we, you know, we hold workshops, we hold think tanks, we have discussions and we ask opinions of people, be it uh, those that are in agencies, in politics or the normal community to move forward. So if this idea was to be floated and discussed further and agreed upon to at least perhaps try a, a smaller version pilot program of it for the next three to five years whilst everything else goes on as it is Mm -hmm. and see what the actual results is have the results speak for themselves the point is that we can do something like that however that those in power aren't willing to even table it or or flick the light switch on it to say look other alternatives are around because it places a risk on their grip on power so until until the people speak loud enough for them to understand that, look, we do want to see other alternatives, nothing will change. But there are steps that can be put in place to say, look, maybe we're all just off our heads discussing this idea, or no, actually this will work and and have the outcome speak for itself. So this may be a naive understanding of something like the EU, but is that not an example of a group of, let's say, bureaucrats, not necessarily randomly selected, but an example of something like that, where it isn't a democratic system, where they're making security type decisions, decisions that affect people in the ways that we're talking about. And people are, say, for instance, in the example of Brexit, incredibly dissatisfied with that bureaucratic system. Yeah, but part of the problem with the EU is it, interferes with every bit of your life that doesn't matter. Okay. So states do security. The EU stuff up how much you pay for milk and bread by what it costs to move things around the EU. Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of like the inverse. If you look at the the Asia-Pacific countries or the the Australasian countries, why could we not have a security council that deals with these issues that brings in all the countries and establishes a security council and they have a different mandate and the politicians that are actually in power. So it, it could work. We're not just talking about Australia because Australia can't do this on its own in terms of a country where we are is a is an end destination for transnational serious organised crime or even issues like terrorism. We need all the neighbouring countries to be able to come into around the table and, and assist each other to counter these issues. So uh, I think a security council for the Asia-Pacific countries would would work. I can't see why it wouldn't. What, what, what about uh, what about um, an organisation like Interpol, for instance? I mean, how how different would this this new structure be from from an international organisation that purportedly yeah, is but meant when you to start with that? something like ARF, you know, the Asian Regional uh, Forum. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, but ARF is what we have. <laughs> how can we make ARF grow? 
uh-huh. because you're not going to get you know Asia Pole until AF can imagine it wants Asia Pole. Well, 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 I mean, we've got a problem here in the Asia Pacific. No one really agrees on the the the, the, pr- the national and regional priorities for security, and that's why we still don't have a functional architecture that can yeah. link continent, continental and archipelagic Archipelagic. Asia together in any meaningful sense. Mm. No one wants to agree on these things and they're highly controversial. And many of the countries in question in Asia are not technically democracies as we would understand. So of course we've got that other issue as well. Okay, these guys are not democracies and therefore in many ways should be uh, organizing their agencies in a much more efficient way, but they're not, (laughs) (laughs) you know. So David, can you tell us what the difference between a proposed security structure in the Asia Pacific would be like when we already have something like Interpol and could we not strengthen the mechanisms of Interpol to do what you're suggesting? Look, I, I think that to me the only def- difference would be the mandate and, and the people of those communities taking ownerships for their own future and they set those mandates. Strengthening what Interpol does, and Interpol has been around for many years. Again, I look at Interpol as a, as a political apparatus, a, a political system, and because they rely upon funding from different countries, etc. And their voice has got to be aligned with the source of the money. You've, you've got to understand that everything people say and do is, is either about money or power. Mm. Now, if you take those things away, people are able to actually make sensible decisions. So having a security council for the Asia Pacific countries or even just Australia and some of the closer neighbours uh, and set that up, that is not influenced by money or power, you will see different results. That is my my whole point around strengthening current international security apparatuses versus a security council that's put in place to see certain objectives such as countering violent extremism through. Yeah, it'd be the advantage of literally you know writing an agreement where anyone signing on knows from day one what they're choosing. These are the only things we do. They're the only things we're interested in. There's a constant budget. There's a constant allocation of personnel from each country. Here's the transparency and accountability rules. Now let the professionals get on with it. And as long as the transparency and accountability is working well, no need to interfere with the process. Exactly right. And as long as the results speaks for themselves, whether it's a reduction in, in transnational serious organised crime, better healthier communities, less drugs around, less crime around, but it, those sort of things are got to be the only thing that determines whether the, the funding flows or not, mm. not whether uh, some of the agendas of the Security Council agrees with who is in power and who is not at that stage. Mm. So, David, you were talking about the importance of local communities to determine their own fate with regard to, you know, how they see themselves in the world, how they defend themselves from all these threats that we, you know, we've been talking about. Uh, you know, how do you envisage the the importance of the com- or the centrality of the community, you know, at the basic local level? So I look at it quite easy um, in terms of if you tra- if you if you are looking to counter a an issue that is in your community, what you need is the ground, base ground truth. At the moment, communities uh, from different races, agendas or, or religion backgrounds, they seem to be separating themselves from law enforcement. There is a disconnect of information. So if communities are put in charge of their own destiny with the assistance of, of the government um, uh, that is in power at that stage and the law enforcement agencies, they're able to know a lot more about the ground truth and that will help them in the decision-making processes and countering those issues. And at the end of it, they are in charge of making their communities better. And I can't see any community that would not agree to having a better future for their kids and, and a better place to live in. So it is important to have key stakeholders involved, and I don't think we're doing enough of that. We, we are sort of coming up with the laws somewhere in Canberra or in Parliament and then we give it to our national security agencies or law enforcement and saying to enforce them. And that brings about the disconnect. So I'm looking at a bottom-up approach as an alternative. Yeah, if we look back to, say, the 1990s in the UK when public-private partnerships emerged, they showed a great lot of potential, but in that typical New Labour Tony Blair way, it was 
public, private, as long as everyone listened to what the government wanted. So what we're talking here is it doesn't need to be public, private. It needs to be private and public. Like it needs to be community first with the support of public to get things done. I, they don't have the resources, but they do have a love of their home, their family, their friends, their community. And I think as human beings and as communities, that's what drives us. Mm. You look at what, what is in anyone's family when they have kids, uh, you know, their the first objective is to make sure that they're safe. So you enlarge that into a community and embed the right attitude amongst people. It'll take a long time for people to actually believe and understand that this is not another trick that some politician is using in order to get voted in. So it's not going to be an overnight fix, but again, it's an alternative that can be that, that, that they can be looked at in order to do something different. When we're talking about this particular issue, of course, we've been focusing a lot on Australia, we've been focusing on the Asia-Pacific, but if we look a little bit further afield and uh, say, for instance, take East Africa as an example, is this stuff that can be directly transposed onto other cultural settings? It could, but understanding of those cultures and how they've been operating for uh, many, many years before we try to take our ideas to their home is very important. Again, I, I'm, I look at it very simplistically and I look at it as the fact that communities have been governing themselves for many years, for centuries in fact. What doesn't work is that we try to make our own version of democracy or our own version of how security and safety looks like to other regions and other countries and they always push back as they would push back. So we don't do enough to understand. So we think just throwing money at, at a community or, or enforcing our ideas onto them will fix the problem. And I don't believe it does. And and the results of the last 20 years, if you like, have spoken. They don't work. Because it doesn't matter how much money you throw at somebody, unless you understand what really drives them in an emotional manner, it will not get them to change their ways or their mind. They just take the money and, and, and they'll go on about the way they have been for centuries. Yeah, this is something I drive my poor undergrad and master students mental about, that if you're not going to do something that has an aspect of local legitimacy, it's only a question of when it's going to fail. And you don't get to decide what local legitimacy is. You ask people what it is and decide if you can work with it. And most communities have a good, clear idea of what is legitimate in their culture. And some communities we're going to agree with, some we're not. But that is the only thing that a community will support, is things it already thinks are legitimate. So the collective good is a fairly fundamental and uncontroversial one. So that, That's exactly right. I couldn't agree with that more. It comes down to, I'm not sure that it's even necessarily possible to understand sometimes the other uh, the needs the wants of other cultures of other groups it just has to be that you accept it is that kind of the you are you're the, putting forth? yeah you get them to explain what they would like to do for their collective good and if it's that a community believes in female genital mutilation you go no yeah you just don't engage mm-hmm. but there's going to be 99 other communities whose idea of the collective good is immediately workable so what do you do so what do you do with the the, the one community of 100 it, well, that's the different thing that is genuinely a political issue to be discussed. It's not one of these long-term security issues. What, what? It, it, it does take a long time. Look, I always say as well that where we are today in the world, we, we haven't arrived here overnight. We've arrived here years and decades of not doing things the way they should have been done. So in order to change this landscape, it'll take a generation or maybe two but it has to get started somewhere. And I think this conversation is on the right path. The problem is how many people would listen to this conversation and are willing to give it a go. But the answer to that question cannot dictate whether we continue talking about it or not. I think we should continue talking about it because at some point, maybe long after we're all gone, somebody will take notice and somebody will actually start putting the first step in place. Yeah, well, people have been trying to work out how to build a better society for a very long time. You know, it's a very long time ago that Plato wrote The Republic and those ideas are still discussed because they help people frame what kind of society they want to live in. Awesome. That's so exactly parts right. Of- and, and, and we don't put enough focus and attention on our, on our youth, on our children and our families in the communities. It's, it's, I think it's, we should do a hell of a lot more than that. It's it's a bit dif- more we are today. It's a bit difficult though, David. You know, uh, if, if you look, you see, because when you're looking at uh, places like in Africa or in the Middle East, you still have very traditional based family structures that haven't broken down because of technology or 
various other aspects. Whereas when you're looking at the West, it's different again. You know, we we kind of like almost celebrate uh, the the modern lifestyle. Uh, whether that's a good or a bad thing, that that's only for time to tell. But again, when you're operating in areas that are more traditional based and you've got a sense of community, a sense of family, a sense of clan, you know, it, it brings with it a number of, I would say, advantages in order to mobilize people and, and, and support at a local level for things to happen. It becomes much more conf- conflict prone when you're in an individualistic driven society where it's all about me and I really don't like well, you, for whatever reason. <laughs> and then you, you're sitting back thinking, well, where, where, where are the point of agreements coming in here? Because we've, we've broken those traditional views of seeing other people as potential allies. Now we see everyone as potential threats. And I think that that's necessarily something that we, we in the West are going to have to grapple with in, in, in coming years. I'm not sure that that's necessarily... I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we've switched from seeing potential allies allies to potential threats i just think that the it's a different size posse in a different direction yeah well look, that, it, look it, it could be a point of disagreement but the fact is there's there's a point here and that is that generally speaking people you know and i use the term people in the widest possible sense mm-hmm. but those people who take up the media cycle um you know they would be probably inclined to see things from a certain perspective that we would have a more nuanced point on but they would have maybe not so much of a nuanced point on because they're too busy paying off their mortgages and they've got, you know, whatever they're being fed from the media, the five-second news bite, and they get mobilised, their sentiments get mobilised by what they see, which may or may not reflect the truth, in, in, but it becomes the truth because it's a yeah. sort of thing that they absorb. Yes, right? yeah, or, or, you know, they read what was in the Australian yesterday, you know, that's what they read on the teleprompter. Well, exactly. so it's like we don't have necessarily a problem in terms of viewpoints in Australian media. We have a problem with monopolistic. Mm, uh, a lack of viewpoints. Uh, yeah. It's not necessarily that it's, oh, it's left wing, it's right wing, whatever, ABC. It's, it's just that e- even among the different wings, mm-hmm. that it all just feeds in from yep. too few people. Yep. And again, this is a point of engaging community. If community won't engage, then things won't get better. That's the one certainty. Well, that's for sure. So how do we get our sense of community back? <laughs> that, that's probably an issue <laughs> for the next podcast. Term, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to drop that no, no, bomb, But I, anyway, <laughs> I just love the idea that David compared the podcast to Plato's Republic. I love the idea that in 2,000 years' time, people are going to be studying the Strategicon podcast in a classics class. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> <laughs> It'll still be up there. It's, you know. <laughs> Maybe we'll be training the new Jean-Luc Picard in the 23rd century or something. I don't know. <laughs> I assure you they would, gentlemen, they would, they would listen to this because, I mean, th- these conversations are, are healthy and, and somebody will take notice and they will listen. Yeah, um, what's the good society is always I, relevant. Exactly right. Okay, well, I think that that's a, that's a wrap, gentlemen. So before we go, any final questions or comments for David? Tim, I'll start with you. No, other than to say that it's been a pleasure listening to him. Yeah, mm. okay, excellent. David? All good, and thank you for your time, David. Th- thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate the invite. You all have a lovely afternoon, and have a glass of red for me. Okay, <laughs> we will, definitely. Thank you very much for your time, David. Take care. Thank Talk you. Talk to you also. Will do. Thank you, sir. And thank you very much, David, for joining us in the studio. Thank you, Tim. And thank you very much, John. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, everyone. We hope that you'll join us for our next exciting adventure through the world of geopolitics. Remember that you can subscribe to Strategicon through the Ozcast network, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify. Please like us on the Sage International Australia Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. We appreciate your support. Also, please comment on any of our articles and podcasts through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and of course on the Sage International Australia site. We welcome any constructive feedback that can help improve our products and we look forward to engaging with our followers. Until next time, goodbye. Oscast. Connect with your potential customers wherever they are. Effective uses Comcast viewership data insights to combine advanced targeting capabilities with premium TV and streaming content so you can deliver the best ad experiences to your audience no matter how they watch. Visit EFFECTV.com. Love this podcast? 
Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.